today. <laughs> this is a heavy sum and a gun. how you come down. Back again. <laughs> Back again. I don't know why I laugh every time I say that. It's probably because, you know, there's always going to be a handful of people that are like, ah, oh, shit, he's still doing this. Damn it. <laughs> That's right. I'm Back again. Back again. Fresh few inches, a couple inches of snow out there. And a clear day. Now, what's new? There's lots new in the world going on, but... I don't know. What do you do, right? What do you do if you have true, authentic interest in what should be interesting and important to you? You already know what's going on, and it's a shit show. 
think anyone, if I could suggest anything to anyone who might be a little confused these days on what the hell's going on in their lives and what, what truly affects your life, no matter how much you want to ignore it. If you feel bored for, for a few minutes today, write down a list of what your government has done to you and your community the past couple of years. All right, just, just a quick short list of what you come up with that they have done to you in a bad way. And then, and then after you do that, think about the reasons why you would believe them when it comes to anything going on in the world, why you would support them in any way with what they're doing in different places of the world. Why? Right? There you go. That's all I got to say. I'll bite my lip. <clears throat> now, what's new in the home front? Well, there's a big cat across the road from the house yesterday in broad daylight. I didn't get to see it. Somebody got a picture of it. <laughs> and then uh, Sarah's little French bulldog. She goes, oh, look, there goes Griffin. He goes all the way up our long driveway because our neighbor down the road has a French bulldog too. And they'll go and play and meet up with each other. And I'm like, so there is a cougar got a photograph taken of in broad daylight right across the road. And there's Griffin way up there right now. She's like, <laughs> runs to the door. Griffin, get back here. Right? That's all I need is for a freaking big cat to grab that little munchkin and take off with them. Oh my God. She'd be putting a stray coat. Anyway, what else is going on? Lots is going on. Lots of voices need to be heard. Now, 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 now. A few people were a little upset about my harsh words yesterday. About somebody's story getting changed. Well, in life, you reap what you sow. And if anybody is going to actually suggest to me I might be harsh in a way, good God, you're Words are falling on deaf ears, I'll tell you what. Wrong guy. Wrong guy. Offended culture. No respect. Now, Babylon. Here we go. Resuming. Hearing voices. Word for word. This is titled My Experience. Hi, Steve. My name is Karen. And several years ago, I lived in a small coastal town. I stayed in a small travel trailer up the road from us. They started to develop the area. I would say about three years ago, I was woken by a loud bang on the right side of my trailer, then the back end, and finally the left side. I could feel the footsteps. And here's where it gets strange. Either way you walk around the trailer, there are motion, there are motion sensor lights, and none of which went off. That's weird. How can a monkey or gorilla figure out how to do that trick? In the morning, I saw that it hit with such force that he knocked my speaker covers off and the mirror of the wall in my bathroom. I was so confused. I talked to my son. He wanted me to watch your channel. Never did I. Never. I never did until now. This wasn't the end. I started hearing whoops and howls so loud that I could feel it in my heart. Well, that's my story. We, my son and I, have always been believers, so now I am an avid follower of your channel. I offer support to anyone who's had experiences and encounters. Thank you, Steve, for all that you do. There you go. All right, Karen, I hope uh, hope that's the extent of it. I hope you don't get terrorized too much more. I don't know why they do that to people, innocent people. I haven't a clue. There's a whole pile of real shitty people out there they could be targeting, right? <laughs> There's a whole lot of shitty people out there that a lot of beings and people and whoever groups could be targeting but they don't i don't get it why always us the innocent right why the innocent people just trying to live their life and mind their own business appreciate you writing in and your kind words support what's that you guys hear that video a handful of years ago there was a guy in a trailer and it was getting the shit beat out of it and he was on a phone freaking out at the same time it sounded pretty terrifying whatever's going on oh hold on the dog wants in all right the co-host is in the room it's funny i give her uh her food out there every, every morning when we come in the shop and then uh, she'll eat it out there on the shop floor and then when i think it's she's about done that'll 
I'll open the door and call her in here, which she loves to come in here and hit the, the rug down here. But she will not come to me if I'm standing on the door and calling. She won't. She's standing down there on the concrete floor looking at me, and then I have to go down there, and then she wags her tail, and then she comes running up beside me and runs into the room. Every single day. I don't get it. It's like, come on, what are you doing? Just get up here. Nope, you gotta come and get me. I think maybe it's because the rat trap snapped her in the face up top of the stairs that one time. Don't forget that, right? It's kind of weird. She would not come up here no matter what after after that happened. Anyway, sorry for the interruption. The co-host is in the room. All right, here we go. This is titled Red Now. I no longer feel comfortable alone in the wilderness. I've watched your videos going over similar experiences. I wanted to reach out and share something that keeps me up at night and I think about all the time. I'm a 28 year old male and I've been hunting since I was seven. I've always felt very comfortable and at peace in the wilderness, often hiking, camping, and hunting. My past two archery hunts, I've gone solo, camping in a remote area in a tent and hiking and hunting for miles by myself. Sometimes walking back to camp in the dark. I feel sad that I have lost this sense of comfort and in a way have lost part of what I love. All of these, all of this stems from my experience during my last archery hunt. After a few days of chasing elk in northwestern New Mexico, my hunting buddies departed camp as they had to go back to work, leaving me to hunt alone for five days. The days of hunting were normal, and I covered many miles and had some exciting moments. I hiked joyfully without worry or fear, absorbing the challenge and excitement of elk hunting. I carry a 40 caliber pistol on my hip and feel confident in fending off any bear or mountain lion that wants to take a jab at me. I would get back to camp usually around sunset. I would time my hike back to be nearing camp close to last shooting light. I usually cook a meal and lay down in the tent and relax from being on my feet. I had attached the rain cover on my tent. Hold it, what are you chewing on? Hey, what do you got? Huh? What do you got? Nothing? All right. Sorry. I, usually, I would usually cook a meal and lay down in the tent and relax from being on my feet. I had attached the rain cover on my tent as some of the sounds I'd been hearing outside of my tent made me uneasy. And I would just lay there paranoid and staring outside if I could. If I could. So I'd rather not be able to see out. Also, I preferred the idea of anything outside of my tent being unable to see inside. One of the first nights alone, I laid down and played my Bible audiobook. I'm not a major, I'm not major religious, but I had been interested in reading the Bible solely based on its cultural and historical significance. I believe I was listening to Proverbs when I heard rocks rolling as if getting walked on 40 yards or so from my tent. The multiple times I heard heavy footsteps run past the front of my tent and multiple times I heard heavy footsteps run past the front of my tent within 20 yards. These footsteps freaked me out and puzzled me because it was all I could because I could feel their impact through the ground as if whatever it was coming from was heavy but didn't hear knocking or galloping sound indicative of a hoofed animal. Another, another peculiarity was that, it's, that it seemed that I heard more activity when the Bible audiobook was playing. It was very difficult to go to sleep, and I heard noises almost every night. After the first night, I started to have some whiskey to ease my nerves before bed, which I noticed did have an effect on my bravery, as I began responding to sounds by opening the tent with a flashlight and drawn pistol and asking, Who's there? But this noise I heard gives me the chills to this day. It has made me rethink how I will conduct future hunts. One night laying in the tent, I heard wood on wood noise. Knock, knock. These knocks were loud, solid, and sounded deliberate. I played scenarios in my head trying to justify this sound with a logical explanation. Maybe a branch fell from a tree and hit the other branches on the way down. But this didn't make sense to me. If that was the case, you'd hear everything hitting the ground in a more chaotic manner. And it wasn't an elk rubbing its antlers, because elk don't rub their antler like that. 
like an F in baseball bat against a tree. I laid there perfectly still, barely breathing, gripping my gun, and listening for any information that would make sense of what I heard. I eventually desensitized myself and meditated myself to sleep. I never saw anything, smelled anything, or found anything disturbed that I noticed. But I still cannot explain what I heard out there, and it makes me not want to ever camp alone again. This bothers me as I love the outdoors and feel like I can now and only enjoy the outdoors partially and conditionally. I think I'm very open-minded about supernatural slash paranormal phenomena, and I think this magnifies my fear. As opposed to someone who doesn't believe anything out of the ordinary exists. From a logical perspective, I can comprehend the possibility of a human species evolving separate and in a different manner from us. I also often think of the human sense spectrum only being a small sector of detectable frequencies, leaving much potential for things we don't even know of. All of this, I think, makes this situation worse, as my imagination goes wild as I'm frozen hearing weird shit happen outside of my tent. I think I needed to get this out, and would like some feedback. I think about this almost every day. I'd appreciate any words of advice for coping with the discomfort I have acquired for the remote outdoors. I'd like to find a philosophy for thinking about this in a way that doesn't scare the shit out of me. I want to be comfortable in the woods again. Feel free to share my story as you please. Thank you for your time, Aaron. Okay, Aaron, feel free, bro. <laughs> uh, if you've been here any t amount of time, I don't even know when that was sent, actually, but if you've been, been here any amount of time, I mean, I just got scared out of my camp for the first time ever this last fall by myself. Elk hunting, Northern British Columbia, but I didn't go home. I didn't quit, and uh, I don't think I don't even think about that every day. I don't. And that was the same uh, the same week my knife was placed in my pack out of freaking nowhere, and I don't think about that every day either. And when I did have, I don't know what that freaking noise. I don't know what that noise was when I was in my tent. But it scared the living shit out of me. And uh, I left. And then I I came back the next morning and I moved my camp. I only moved my camp three miles. Maybe three miles away, maybe even two. And that was it. And I carried on. So I don't know. A lot of people ask how to deal, what to do, how to, how to help them squash your anxiety and the nervousness. But... All I can do is offer up what I do, and that's to speak out loud. Say, so just leave me the F alone, man. Leave me alone. And then carry on. And do not fear death. I think that might be key, I wondered. Because I, I don't fear death at all. I just don't. And I've never had... I mean, I was scared shitless from that noise. But it didn't... I did, My fright... I wouldn't even describe my fright I had the same way that people describe. All of a sudden, I was flooded with absolute terror. Terror in my soul. I've never felt fear like that in my life. That wasn't me. That wasn't the fear that I had. I mean, I was freaking shitting myself. Maybe I shouldn't Maybe I shouldn't describe it so intensely, but I was like, holy shit. Uh-uh. I'm out of here. Whatever's making that sound, it's getting close. Whatever. It's... I don't need that coming to my camp. I'm not into this. I don't need this. But I wasn't absolutely filled with terror to my soul. Now, I don't know. Does that have something to do with not fearing death? That they that I can't that I haven't had that happen to me? I don't know. Do you need to do you need to have it in you possibly to quote fear death? To be able to be filled with terror all of a sudden? Like emotionally assaulted inside. I don't know. I haven't a clue. I haven't a clue, but please don't quit, man. Don't quit hunting. Don't quit going. All right? Don't quit. Don't be robbed of life. All right? There's enough of our lives are being robbed today by human beings to the point it's like that everybody should band together and freaking stop it at all and use every method known to human kind to stop it but getting 
getting quality of life, any kind of life robbed from you is an absolute violation. It makes me want to vomit. So don't let it do that. Don't quit. All right? Just go with your gut. Doesn't feel good? Go somewhere else. That's what I do. I'm still doing it. I'm still getting my elk. I'm still getting my deer. I'm still going. I'm still having fun. I'm still steelhead fishing. Don't let them steal from you. Now, who's next? Who's next? All right, this is titled. I think this is important for people to know. All right, here we go. Hi, my name is Roger. I'm in my mid-40s. I had an incident as a little kid that has never left me. I still look over my shoulder and go slow, taking in everything around me before I move forward when I'm in the woods or fishing at a lake. I love forests and wooded areas, especially when there is a mountain stream running through them. I spent most of my life hunting and fishing. My dad tells me I caught my first bluefish at six months old, haha, -ha, off of the coast of Maryland. My mother always told me my mother always told me I came out with a rifle in one hand and a fishing pole in the other. There is literally nothing better than that experience of being at peace with nature. I'm telling you this so you can understand why what I'm about to tell you isn't natural in any way I can understand. Granted, I was young, under 10, but I can still remember the paralyzing fear. That feeling has never left me. Anyways, I will get into it. I was living in Maine at the time, around Lisbon Center. We had a post office and a corner store for our town. No gas station or actual grocery store. It was literally a one-horse town. We lived at the dead end of a road that emptied into the great forests of Maine. Just for some perspective. My backyard started with giant pine trees that, as a child, seemed to reach into the sky. I remember being up in those trees looking down at my brother on the ground. He looked like a little ant from up there. I spent most of my childhood hunting those forests and fishing those streams and rivers. It was about a year before I moved to Michigan that it happened. I was walking with my cousin down a well-made trail, probably five or six feet wide, about a half mile from my house. Our heads were mostly down and glancing at each other as we quietly talked and walked along. For some reason, we both froze in mid-step and couldn't move. I could barely raise my head to look mostly forward. I heard no sound, but for some reason, we both froze. I remember the feeling because it scares the hell out of me, even thinking about it. Something I'll never forget. My body was paralyzed in place except being able to slightly raise my head. I was struck with the fear of death into my whole body, and I don't know why. I'd never seen his face. It was too close to us. We couldn't see his face. My eyes looked forward, and it was like a foot in front of me. If I wasn't paralyzed, I could have punched it. It was that close. It didn't make any sound. It didn't even move. But for some unknown reason, I couldn't move. And the fear I have never felt before or since was in me. I seen the two human-like arms going down its side. The reddish long flowing hair that slightly moved in almost still wind. That moment has been etched in my mind, and I have never been able to let it go. Then, it was, as if, it was as if the paralysis started lifting, and I could feel my head turning to my cousin and his to me, but it was like watching a blurry movie, moving picture. The image I saw looking at him was distorted, and I could only imagine mine was to him. It was like our heads were stretched and our mouths open too far to be real. We started turning and ran as fast as we could until we got back to the house. Excuse me. I never seen his face. He was too close to me and I, and I couldn't look up. I've never doubted myself as to what I saw. I knew and still know. Nothing ever changed that. I tried to tell my story what happened when I was young, but the few that believed me said I probably saw a bear. It wasn't a bear. I was laughed at and ridiculed as a kid. My cousin said he never remembers being in the woods with me when I told him he was with me. He won't admit what happened, but I will. Whatever this creature was, it had the power to emit overwhelming fear to the point of paralysis. 
It never did anything that would make you think it was aggressive. It did nothing scary. To this day, I've never felt anything like it. I've been on the ground 30 yards from a black bear that wasn't sure what it wanted to do. I was scared, but not that kind of fear. I know what I saw and what happened, and nobody will tell me any different. I've always had this feeling that if I had been alone that day, as I had a few times in the past on that same trail, I wouldn't be alive. I don't know why I've always felt that way. It was an instinct in my gut. In hindsight, now hearing all of all the missing children and clothes found in the wrong places, I feel if I'd been alone that day, my name would be among those. I quit telling my story over 30 years ago. Nobody believed me. But that paralyzed fear and that image of seeing that hairy beast with arms only inches from my face has never left me. The stories I hear you talk about with the missing children makes me wonder if that almost happened to me. I hope this helps somebody. Helps people understand what may have happened to their missing child. You've given me the strength to speak out. Thank you, Roger. Roger, welcome to the club, my man. I'm glad you came forward, especially here. It's a safe place you found your people. You found your people, man. It's it's odd. It's an odd feeling. You, you know, if I was by myself, I probably would have been dead. It doesn't make sense, though. It's just two kids side by side, both paralyzed with fear. What's the other kid going to do that stops this thing from making it disappear? It doesn't make sense to me. Couldn't move, couldn't lift my head. Because every monkey and gorilla does that to human beings, right? Especially at the zoo. You know, you go to the zoo and you see monkeys and gorillas. They always make you stand there paralyzed and you can't move. It happens all the time. I said nobody ever. Anyway, I hope you're still here, man. I hope you're still here listening to all of the people. You're not going to get ridiculed here. Ever. Now, did I just mark this as red? Or not? It's a short one. I don't think it was marked as red. Anyway, blah, blah. My Childhood Encounters, the title of this email. Hi, Steve. My name is Michael Stricklett. Stricklett. And after, after listening to you, I wanted to tell my story and no longer care what anyone thinks. I am tired of worrying about what people think of my encounter when they were not there. My encounter was in 1976 when I was eight years old. I was at a dude ranch in Nebraska, which I went to for two to three weeks each summer. We'd ride horses and camp out. Sometimes the treks were for days. Back then you could do things like like that, as parents do not need to be around their kids 24-7, 365. One end of the ranch had a room for girls, and the other end for the boys. Days before my encounter, one of the girls ran into our room yelling, an ugly face was watching her from the bathroom window. I thought she was just trying to scare us, but she was bone white and shaking, really scared. I asked her to describe the face, and she described what sounded today like the face of a Sasquatch. I knew nothing of Sasquatch back then. It was not in my vocabulary. It was not on my radar. Days later, we were on a long trip, and it was a clear summer night, bright stars and bright moon. We were all sleeping around the remains of a campfire. I woke up and remembered looking up at a hill and felt like I was being watched. About 60 feet away, coming down the hill, was a tall form in silhouette. I stood up and watched it, thinking it was on one of the other guys trying to scare us. One of the older guys trying to scare us. What I first noticed that scared me were the length of the arms. They hung down to its knees. When I stood up watching, it stopped and watched me. The next scary thing is it hunched over and started swaying left to right. It made no sense. Not sure if we watch each other. Not sure if we watch each other for 30 seconds or 3 minutes. It had long hair, and the head was low on the shoulders. It had it had no sloped skull, but seemed in bulk like a very tall chimp, guessing six to seven feet tall. It was not massive, more slender, but I had the impression of solidness and weight to it. I could not make out any facial features. After that time, 
it just walked down the bottom of the hill to a holler, and I lost sight of it. In the morning, I took my horse to the holler, and it was heavy growth. No idea how it walked through there, not making a single sound. No one else was up, and I never mentioned it to them. I just laid back down and did not fall asleep. I never went back to the ranch after this. Since then, a decades later, I can enjoy the I can enjoy the woods. My head's always on a swivel. I don't allow my son in the woods. I'm not scared as much as hyper alert, which ruins any enjoyment I should have had. I can go out with groups of people, but will not camp overnight again. I will not venture too far. Our experience is not as terrifying as others, but I have let it get the best of me. I appreciate your videos and standing up for us who have who have for a long time lived in additional fear of being mocked and ridiculed if we tried to talk about this. Feel free to use this if you would like. Be safe. And best wishes, Michael Stricklett. Michael, appreciate you coming forward, man. I'm sad that you have lost your confidence out there. That's theft. It's a blatant violation. It's theft. And a quick note on those missing children in the second email back. Sorry. Um, I do not believe these beings stealing, are stealing children myself. I believe 100% that dark, dark human beings are responsible for missing children globally. That's what I believe. That's what I believe. Does that mean I would let kids run around the backyard if one of these beings was spotted back there? No. <laughs> right? Of course not. Of course not. I wouldn't let kids run around the backyard if there's a bear in the next lot. Black bear. Right? But I do strongly believe that the, the majority of the missing children are from dark human beings. And I do believe the Western governments know and they possibly promote it. Support it in the behind the scenes. But anyways, moving along. Moving along. Who's this? What's this? This is titled Bigfoot Story. Hi, Steve. My name is Brandon. My family and I moved out to California to Hacienda Heights. My brother and I became really good friends with our neighbor. And one day he asked if we would go camping in the mountains with him and his parents. They went every year to fish in the streams to catch trout. And they brought their two big red Dobermans, which was German trained in the German language. Now, a friend of mine's got one of those German shepherds. They are terrifying animals when they are commanded to be. We got to the campsite and sat everything up and set everything up, the tents and a place for the dogs. And those dogs always scare the hell out of me. I don't know why, they just did. Us boys were between the ages of 8 and 10 years old. The first night was fun. We fished and caught a bunch of our, a bunch, our friends. All right, lacking punctuation. Sorry, you guys. The first night was fun. We fished and caught a bunch. Our friend's mom cooked dinner and we ate and went back fishing and it started to get dark. So we're called back to the campsite where we sat around the fire, and laughed and joked around. We went to bed, got up early and ate breakfast. And while we were eating, we started hearing growling and loud screams and the sound vibrated the ground and we could feel it in our bodies said nearly everyone my friend's dad went to get the two huge dobermans and put their leashes on and brought them up to where we were and those and these big bad dogs were trying to get under the truck and they were pissing all over themselves and they started crying and our friend's dad talking to them in german and the dogs were shaking and managed to break their leashes and get under the truck my friend's dad went and got his gun. And this huge, hairy being was standing above us, looking down at us. My friend's dad said that thing had to be at least nine feet tall and it smelled like a piece of rotting meat. And the smell was so strong, it started making us gag. My friend's dad fired a shot in the air and it didn't even flinch. He ordered us to get in the truck. So we got in the truck as fast as we could and my friend's dad just stood there looking at it. Then it jumped down from the top of a small cliff into the water. 
and the water only came up to its knees. And my friend's mom was screaming at her husband to get in the truck, get in the truck, and let's go. So finally, my friend's dad jumped in the truck and almost forgot about his dogs. He opened the door and called for them, and those dogs moved like lightning into the truck, jumping on us kids and laying across our laps, growling at the thing. He started the truck, slammed in gear, and took off. And we looked back and saw that being jumped from the water and was chasing us down the dirt road. And he caught up to us in a blink of an eye. The being was beating on the truck while running after us. And then we seen other cars coming and we looked back and it was gone, like it vanished in thin air. My friend's dad finally stopped at a gas station to get gas and we're all white as sheets. The gas station attendant came out. The gas station attendant came out, and mind you, this is back in the 80s. And he said, Mister, you must have been in one hell of a wreck. My friend's dad told the guy that he wasn't in a wreck. And the attendant said, what happened to the back of your truck? And we got out and looked. That being had beat the sides of the truck bed down in... Let me read this again. That being had beat the sides of the truck bed down into the truck bed floor. And we just looked at the damage and my friend said, imagine what it would have done to us. The being was mean and angry and didn't like humans. I don't know if someone had done something to him or what, or what, but he was evil. When we got back to our friend's house, his dad told us not to talk about it because people would laugh at us or other friends would make fun of us and call us liars and other names. And now looking back on it, my friend's dad was right after seeing what people are doing to others that come forward. I don't give a shit what people say about me. And if they want to call me a liar, then we could meet up. And they can say it to my face, but they won't like what comes next. But I know what we saw. Sorry? I just lost my spot, you guys. Sorry. But I know what we saw and what that being did. You can use my name. I don't care. And thank you for what you're doing to help us in coming forward and believe in us. Sincerely, Brandon Karcher. Karcher? Karcher. K-A-E-R-C-H-E-R. Brandon, appreciate you coming forward, man. That's one hell of a terrifying, holy shit story. And not too common we hear something like that with the physical contact. Such an intense flavor. Whew. Right? Take from what you will. Take from what you will. But just make sure you listen to everyone and take the patterns out for yourself. Another brave human comes forward. My first and last encounter. It's the next title of this next one. Hello, Steve. I'm going to tell you the events that changed my hunting passion from I couldn't wait till the season came till I sold my best coon hound because it wasn't fair to her to be penned up. It all started when I was about 14. I was coon hunting with my grandfather and uncle. We were walking a river island and my grandpa's dog started barking treed. Upon getting to her, she's not barking hard. Not upon the tree like she normally would be. Excuse me, about the same about the same time my uncle's dog came to check in and he started staring at the area, Sally, my grandpa's dog was barking. He commenced to growling, and all the hair on his body was standing straight up. Limbs broke beyond Sally, and her reaction was the same as Joe my uncle's dog. My grandfather was a hard man, and at that time, I didn't, understand, I didn't understand when he called the dogs off, and we leashed them and walked back, chalant, and we, sorry, and we walked back nonchalantly back to the pickup truck. I asked what the, what did the dogs run, and my grandfather played it off, said it was a, said it was a slick tree. He wouldn't answer at the time, what was causing them to start growling like they were fixing to fight for their life, no matter how much I asked. Fast forward three years, it was the opening night for coon season. The date was October 15th. I had my walker, hound, bonnie, and blue tick buck. Mind you, I was approximately five miles from the spot I was at with my grandfather. I unloaded the dogs, started my journey up an old road. 
that went to the base of the mountain where the inclines started, around a two-mile walk. I got about a half mile or so. The dogs were out hunting, coming back every 10 to 15 minutes to check in, as I, as I call it, and they go back out hunting. At about this point, I could faintly hear something walking behind me. At first, I thought it was one of the dogs, so I didn't pay it any mind. It was nearly half a mile from the end of the road where the mountain starts to incline that I noticed whatever was walking behind me was matching me step for step. They were close, but as I cast my light through the big timber, I couldn't see a thing. I had heard of bobcats being nosy critters, and I played it off again. Figuring I'd have a good chase on my hands if the dogs caught the cat's scent, I was going to try and scare it off. I started walking, but, but decided after about ten steps, I was going to turn quickly and cast my walk light on this cat and scare it off. Well, after I turned and threw my light up, I didn't see a cat. I seen a bear. I thought, looking at me from an old-growth poplar tree. I quickly loaded my single-shot twenty-two long rifle, and I was about to shoot and scare it off when this big, hairy thing... Every bit of seven feet tall and 40 inches wide walked out from behind that poplar and proceeded to walk past me on my right. <laughs> what? Shit. I was scared shitless. Couldn't move, much less pop around at this thing. About that time, my dogs came back and caught sight of it. It started running ahead of me the direction I was intending to go. Was I ever so glad... When my dogs gave chase, I knew I had a chance to get the hell to the truck. I literally broke out running as fast as I could. I knew the mile and a half would take roughly ten minutes, but I was glad to get the shit out of there. About two minutes into my run back to the vehicle, I could hear the dogs chasing parallel to me, but they were on top of the ridge, and I was in the holler. Another minute of hunting, another minute of running, and they were ahead of me, in the direction I was heading. I knew I had to get out of there. This thing was circling me. I ran faster than I ever had, clearing blowdowns I'd normally walk around. I was parked beside an open field where the dirt road I was traveling past. About 300 yards from my truck, I heard the most intense roar I'd ever heard in my life. The dogs had shut up. I didn't have a clue what was going on, but I knew I was getting in my truck. When I reached the gravel road, my truck was roughly 50 yards parked beside the fence that went around the field. And as I got near my truck, the fence was flattened like a tree had fell down on top of it, but nothing was there. The screams continued. I looked and my hounds had crawled under my truck. I opened the door and they jumped inside, and I wasn't going to waste time putting them in the rear box. You can say I made record time getting home that night. I lived with my grandfather. Upon walking in the house after tying up my dogs, I asked my grandpa if I had a coon. Hell no was my answer, as I caught myself speaking to him like that. He looked at me and said, boy, you're pale. Look, you ain't getting sick. I told him, no, I seen something. And I sat down and explained what I saw and what happened. His first words were, you're up on the mountain by the old dynamite shed. I asked him immediately how he knew. The only thing he said after that was, don't go back in them woods. And then I had a lot of, that I had a lot of other good hunting land. I never questioned my grandfather that night. In fact, I never coon hunted again. In 2005, as my grandpa was getting pretty much housebound, not able to get out and walk. With that night still in my mind and him knowing where I was without anyone knowing, I had to ask to get some type of closure. He said, Bill, when I was your age, we went to look for a guy in that very spot that went hunting but never came home and we never found him. He had shot himself. I asked, do you think it was his ghost, his spirit? He said, you're not getting it. The guy was built like a mule, could beat any man that, that he knew of, and he was too rel religious to commit suicide for no reason. I said, do you think he was murdered? He looked at me and said, I'll never say this again. The guy we found had two broken legs. He was scared into killing himself. 
I've seen them several times. Sorry. I've seen them several times day and night, hunting or cutting timber, but the ones up there will kill you. So this is grandfather still talking. There's some punctuation missing, so let me read that again. He was scared into killing himself. I've seen them several times, day and night, hunting or cutting timber, but the ones up there will kill you. I encountered one once drilling ore in that very spot. I asked what was I asked what was said of the man's legs. It wasn't reported on. It was the early nineteen hundreds. We kept it to ourselves, but figured he was tortured and committed suicide to get it over. I then asked what he had seen when up there drilling, or, and he looked at me and said, the conversation ends here. I have, I have a feeling he had an encounter like me. I'm in my 40s, and I drive by the same field I parked that night, but I always look straight ahead until I pass a spot. There's many things in life people will do for a dollar, and I wouldn't walk that two-mile journey back in those woods for a million. If I had the money, I'd pay to know what I witnessed. Thank you for letting me tell someone, other than my grandfather, who took this with him to his grave. You're the first person I've told, Steve. Please don't use my name. Blank, blank, as my son's named after me, as I'm, I am my dad. Personally, I don't care, but my son is still young, and it could catch up with him. This took place in Augusta County, Virginia, in the Shenandoah Valley. Okay, did I read your name in the beginning? No, I didn't. Did I? I didn't. All right. Wow. There you go. There's some pretty intense experiences out there on the planet, isn't there? There's a lot of people. It's amazing how many people. Such a crazy top. It's just, everything's, it's just frustrating, right? It's crazy to be aware of so many truths. The truth, absolute truth. It's going on, especially when you eyewitness it for yourself. Absolute truth going on, yet as human beings, we can be easily conditioned to not speak about it. That is so, we are such a bizarre species. This is such a freaking bizarre ride being alive being alive as a human being is so freaking crazy don't you think you gotta admit it by now being a human being today probably any day is it's just it's just a crazy ass ride at least well at least all these people have had to harbor these shitty experiences are finally coming forward here right thank god Thank God we've all of you have created this safe place. Thank God. It's helping. Believe it or not, it's helping them. It's helping many people. Shenandoah Valley, huh? Never been there, I don't think. All right, let me read one more. And then I got to get going. This is titled... The Mother Sasquatch. Steve, my name is Jeff McComas. I'm from the very southern tip of Ohio. I'm an honorably discharged Navy veteran. I served during the Persian Gulf conflict. And if you were to talk to anyone who knows me, they'll tell you that I did not lie about anything. In 1986, I'd gone deer hunting in an old coal strip mine area that is now part of the Wayne National Forest in Gallia County, Ohio. There were many encounters with these things reported since the early 1800s in and around Gallia County. Well, this is what happened to me. It was bow season 1986. I'm not sure of an exact date, but I had scouted this area since early September and had built a few of the old-fashioned deer stands in a patch of woods that probably spanned two miles in each direction. There were a few old strip mine roads and two old strip mine ponds. I tried to alternate between the tree stands going to a different one each day that I hunted on this particular day. I decided to go to the stand that was maybe 40 to 50 yards away from one of the old ponds. I got to the tree stand around 5 a.m. It was still dark, cold, and foggy when the sun finally started to break and the fog started rolling back. 
I started hearing a buzzing sound, and I thought to myself, there can't be any bee's nest in this tree, especially as cold as it was. When all of a sudden, I caught a glimpse of something out of the corner of my eye. I first thought it was a black bear, but as it broke through the fog, I made out what it really was. Okay, there's no punctuation, not even a period in this whole thing, okay, you guys? But we'll get it. I first thought it was a black bear, but as it broke through the fog, I made out what it really was. And she was maybe six to seven feet tall and was carrying a baby, a baby one. And the whole time she was humming and looking at the baby one. I don't know if it was a newly born baby or if it was, a, or if it was sick, but she walked to the edge of the pond, got a scoop of water in her hand, and either gave it to the baby or wiped him off. But as quickly as she appeared, she turned and walked away through the thickest briar patch. And after that, I didn't hear the buzzing or humming anymore. I feel like that she was so into taking care of the baby one that she didn't notice me sitting up in the tree stand. It's probably one of the most uneventful encounters that have been sent to you, but it's absolutely true. They do exist, and I know it to be fact. Again, my name is Jeff McComas. McComas? McComas. So I'll put in a picture of your name, man. I'm 53 years old. I have 12 grandchildren. Been married to the same gal for 30 years. And a truly honest individual. Feel free to use my name and to tell my story. Thanks. Boom. There you go. Straight to the point. Saw it. And I believe this man 100%. Appreciate you coming forward, man. You're a brave man. Brave, honest man. Appreciate you. And I hope being here is helping, helping you uh, learn more about your experience in life that day. Crazy, right? Okay, one more. This is titled Swamp Bigfoot. Hello, my name is... I hope It's funny, I always get hesitant when they start off sharing their name because it sucks when you get to the end. Oh, P.S., don't share my name. Tell me right away, don't share my name or just don't put it in the email. Hello, my name is Thomas Frano. F-R-A-I-N-O. I'm 53 years old and I grew up hunting in the swamps of Louisiana and fishing inshore and offshore. Back when I was 19... A friend of mine, Rob, and I used to go shining deer and hogs. Yeah, I know it's against the law, but we still went out there and did it anyway. It's a good way to get some quick meat for the freezer. One night, we were hunting behind the Stennis Space Center, an area known as the Honey Island Swamp, right across the state line in Mississippi. We'd park on the road and walk down swamp on both sides. We can usually, we can usually sniper a hog or a deer crossing the roads. And this one night we parked the car like we usually do in an old piece of shit. Sorry. This one night we parked the car like we usually do. An old piece of shit Pinto hatchback. I seen one of those the other day. I just about fell over. We both had 12 gauge shotguns and big ass light on our heads. Mag lights taped to the shotgun barrels. As we're walking down the road one night, all of the sudden, something started matching our steps off the tree line in the swamp. It was kind of crazy. We'd start walking. I would hear splish, splash, splish, splash, splish, splash, two feet walking through the swamp. We'd shine the light in the swamp to see where this noise is coming from. It was inside the tree line, out of our line of sight. Even with the big effing light in our heads and the two mag lights taped the shotgun barrels, we always had the plugs out of our shotguns shooting three-inch double-odd buck magnums with additional couple boxes stuffed in our pockets. If whatever it was would have walked on the road, we would have seen it. It would have had the shit knocked out of it. We were down the road about a mile and a half, stopping a big turnaround, just staring in the swamp with the lights on, trying to figure out what the app was in there. It was pacing back and forth in front of us. We could not see what it was. And we didn't want to waste ammo blind shooting. 
But this time, my fear started getting the best of me. And I started, I started farting my ass off. It may sound funny, but when you get the shit scared out of you, you start farting your effing ass off. Okay, man. Whatever it was, we haven't had anybody report that yet. Okay. Whatever it was, never made a sound. Never made a roar. Never made a growl. Never made a noise. Just footsteps. One foot splish, one foot splash. At this point, we both said, F this shit. We started walking back towards the car, and this effort still pacing us in the swamp. Splish, splash, splish, splash. We got maybe 200 yards from the car, and then the splish, splash stopped. And as luck would have had it, as we were turning the effing Pinto around, it got stuck in a ditch. We had to get the jack out. One of those old steel bumper jacks put it on the bank of the ditch and jacked the bumper, pushing the front end out of the ditch. We had to do this a few times to get it out. It must have, it must have took a half an hour, maybe longer. The whole time waiting for something to pop out the effing swamp and gobble our ass up. We never went back to that part of the swamp again. I brought this up with my partner, Rob, a couple weeks ago, and he still remembers it like yesterday. I told him it was Bigfoot. He tells me I'm effing crazy. I'm now 53. Like I said, I have six kids, a wife, a very hectic job running a towing operation out of the city of New Orleans, dealing with assholes all day long. If anyone, if anybody wants to believe the story, they can believe it. Anybody that doesn't want to believe it can suck a dick. <laughs> I don't care. I just want to share my story with you. Excuse me. I'm still hunting the woods, not scared not scared I do more fishing now than hunting offshore in my boat out of Venice, Louisiana. If you ever come down to New Orleans, hit me up. I'll take you out of my Glacier Bay and go catch some tuna. Thomas here's Trano Sr. Thomas, appreciate you sharing that, man. It's one hell of an honest account, right? Not too many people admit to farting their brains out when they're scared. And there you go. Another brave individual comes forward. Another, another, another. All right. You know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share one more. It's just that there's so many. There's so many people. And they're all going to get hurt. They're all going to get hurt here unless somebody absolutely puts a head, hold in my head and stops me. First. All right. Here we go. Here's another one. No title. I just watched your video about that game warden from Minnesota. And your rant on the sixth sense that some of us still have. I, for one, don't seem to possess that talent. But my wife sure had it. They all do. All females have got it. I bought an acre and a half or so of land down in northwest Arkansas some years ago. As I was thinking of building a house to retire in. Where it's not so damn cold. A couple of years later, I gathered up the family for a couple of weeks vacation. And make some plans to build that house. So, off to Arkansas we went. And after finding the property, we went out to inspect it again. Parked on the road right next to a large tree with some bushes surrounding it. And my wife and son and daughter went out to see what kind of animals we could scare up. This was a beautiful summer day in 1983 at about 10 or 11 a.m. And soon I realized that things were unnaturally quiet there. No birds chirping, no squirrels running around or anything else that I could see. And there's a deep ravine behind where the house would be built. And we walked about halfway down it. When I told my wife that things were strangely quiet, and I wondered why, my wife responded by saying that something was watching us, and that she was going to take Laura back to the truck. What's watching us, I said, and she said that she didn't know, but that she could feel it watching. So off they went, and Dusty and I continued our journey down the ravine. And at the bottom, I still hadn't aroused so much as a gnat, so I told Dusty that we should get back to the truck and find the girls. The walk back to the truck was uneventful. But when we got there, all hell broke loose. As I opened the driver's door, something behind that tree in those bushes we were parked by exploded down into the ravine as fast as any horse can run. Dusty panicked in that instant, and he jumped head first over the headrest and right into Laura's lap in the back seat. I confess I've never been that rattled before at anything. 
and after two hours and two tours in Vietnam, and my career at the SD Penitentiary, that's saying something. All I could hear was an enormous thud, thud in quick succession as this thing beat feet retreating. Initially, I said to myself that I just encountered a Razorback hog, but I knew it couldn't run on two feet like this thing had. Then I noticed a small thicket of trees at the bottom of the ravine, and the treetops opened wide as something raced through them. There were small trees with probably two-inch trunks on them, but the tops spread out maybe eight feet apart as it passed through them. I never saw what it was, sadly, but I have a hunch it wasn't it wasn't an everyday event. The earth seemed to tremble when this thing launched itself down that ravine. And by the sounds of that thud and the feel of the earth as it ran, I would have thought that it flushed out a rhinoceros. That damn thing was big. Anyway, to say the least. After that, I noticed that my wife had a sixth sense about almost everything. I got to where I couldn't even lie to her anymore because she knew better. Because she knew better, and that got scary. You can use my name all you'd like to. Respectfully, Jerry Sutherland, Sioux Falls, South Dakota. South Dakota? SD? South Dakota. Okay, Jerry, appreciate that, man. Uh, the female the female of our species, they're the moms, right? They carry the babies. They have got way better hearing, sense of smell. They shoot better on average than us with weapons. They are the force to be reckoned with, right, when it comes to uh, fight or flight or danger or protecting, obviously. Now I gotta get going. And believe it or not, I've abandoned my phone for almost a week. <laughs> Feels kind of good, really. I'm sure I pissed off a lot of people, but oh well. I have just had too many things I really, 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 really need to get done. I've been overwhelmed like you wouldn't believe. But I've got seven pages left on my Blacktail Hunter book. Seven pages left to edit. Done. That's pretty exciting. Then I just have to get the cover confirmed and the text written accurately on the back of it from my from Roy Dye. And then uh, get that to get that project done and out there. And then move on to my next. Or continue with another. Continue with everything. Anyway, anyway, I guess that's about it for for now. It's funny I've had a I uh, I crack my emails first thing in the morning. I try to I try to read a pile of emails in the morning and save and save a handful of them to my notes. And a couple of people were uh, a few people sniveled about whatever I said yesterday. I don't. There's no drama here. There's no drama with me and any other channels really i mean i'll lash out of some sons of bitches who violate you people you people us people violate innocent people but uh somebody emailed me the fact that somebody yesterday who was mentioned here actually came on to us and this channel a few times in the past unprovoked so all i'm saying is you reap what you sow in life if you do some shitty things shitty things are going to come back on you might take a little bit of time but that's the way it goes in life you reap what you sow. All right? Anyway. Anyway, anyway. Oh, anybody's worried about being offended? This is definitely the wrong guy to snivel to. <laughs> right? Suck it up, buttercup. Okay, I'll be back tomorrow. Share my story at howtohunt.com. Or, or tell my story at howtohunt.com. That's where you will get your truth shared word for word. And this is not... This is not a place meant for entertainment. We don't promote this place ever. I don't ever promote this place. I just did a podcast the other day. Never spoke a word about this topic. I didn't even didn't even didn't even come to my mind to bring that topic up for one tenth of a second. Why? Because I just don't. If you know, you know. Obviously, if you have a curiosity on your own instantly or you heard somebody say something then obviously you'll find this place but this place has been geared up since the beginning for those who know they want answers want to figure the shit out so there if you come here for entertainment well sucks to be you anyway enough babbling i gotta go
I'll be back tomorrow, but tomorrow I'll be, uh, I'm going to be remote somewhere tomorrow. I have to go do something in the woods. I've been inside working nonstop like an idiot from the time I wake up until I wrote 11 o'clock at night. I've been stuffed in that screen getting, uh, getting a, a very special project done with tunnel vision. But tomorrow, I'm going to snap. I'm going to go crazy. So I got to go. Tomorrow, tomorrow I'm going to the woods. And I'll take you guys with me. And I'll come back and share what I saw. Later. Yeah.